In this video, I want to walk you through an example of a research methodology from a dissertation that earned full distinction. I'm also going to take you through our free research methodology chapter template so that you have all the tools you need to write up a winning chapter. So let's do it. Hey, Derek here from Grad Coach. If it's your first time here, the Grad Coach channel is where we discuss all things research related so that you can approach your research project, whether that's a dissertation, thesis, or any other sort of formal academic research project with confidence and competence. This particular video is based on an extract from our online course, Research Methodology Bootcamp. If you're new to research, formal academic research, you'll definitely want to check that out. And to say thanks for watching this video, we've included a special offer for you. You can find the links to that in the description below. Now, as I mentioned in this video, we're going to be looking at an example of a research methodology from an actual dissertation that earned distinction. And we're going to be looking at our research methodology chapter template. Both of those you can access using the links in the description below. They're all completely free. In terms of the structure of this video, we're going to be starting by looking at the chapter template so that you can see exactly what needs to go into a methodology chapter and how that should ideally be structured. And then we'll look at the example chapter from the dissertation, from the actual dissertation, and that will allow you to see exactly how this all comes to life. So without further delay, let's jump into it. Right, so here we have our methodology chapter template. And as I mentioned, you can access this completely free of charge on the Grad Coach blog. You'll get the links to that in the description below this video. Now, it's worth mentioning up front that every university and every degree program is different. And so what the expectations will be in terms of what goes into the methodology chapter will vary slightly from university to university. Yeah, we've got a pretty generic, comprehensive chapter template, but it's important to pay attention to any briefing documents and especially any templates that your university has provided. Naturally, anything that you find there would supersede what we've got in this template. Nevertheless, this should provide some useful insight for you. So let's get started. We'll skip over the first page, which is just providing some additional free resources and these will be really useful if you are just starting out on your research journey. So naturally the first section of the research methodology chapter is the introduction. Typically within a dissertation every section or every chapter will have some sort of introduction and this is really just a, a brief quick intro to the chapter. You might talk about things like the research problem and your research aims. This is just to provide a bit of a reminder to the reader and to contextualize the entire chapter for them. You might also state what the purpose of the chapter is, in other words, to outline your methodological approach. And you might also provide some sort of outline of a structure to give the reader a view of what exactly you're going to be covering and in what order. So giving them a bit of a roadmap. You want to keep this section really brief. You're not going to earn major marks in this section. In fact, you probably won't earn any marks. What this section does is just makes your marker's life a little bit easier. And so you do want to pay attention to it. You do want to put the effort in here, but keep it brief. You don't want to burn a whole lot of word count in this section. So from here, you're going to move into the body section of your methodology chapter. And naturally, this is where you're going to earn marks. This is the meat of your methodology chapter. Generally speaking, we recommend structuring this section in a inverted pyramid style. In other words, going from the most sort of conceptual, high level strategic type choices and then working your way down to the more practical and tactical choices, the more hands on stuff. So what that might look like is something that follows the structure of first, the research philosophy, second, the research approach. In other words, your qual or quant or mixed methods. The research design might follow that, descriptive, correlational, etc. Then your sampling strategy, and then finally your data collection and analysis methods. So you can see in this flow, we're going from the really high level stuff, the philosophical stuff, down to the really, really practical stuff. How will you collect your data? How will you analyze it? Of course, this isn't set in stone. This is a recommended approach because it allows for a good logical flow and it allows you to build on each choice and go down into more detail, but it isn't set in stone. So again, if your university is prescribing a different order, then definitely pay attention to that and follow that. 
What we've got here follows a fairly generic structure from a popular framework called the Research Onion. It's one option, it's certainly not the only option, but if you are interested in learning more about that, we do have a video about it and you can select the link in the description below. Right, so then moving down to the very first section of the body, and that is the research philosophy. Now, the research philosophy is about the sort of underlying beliefs and assumptions and principles that will underpin how you're going to approach your research. And we won't go into detail here, but generally speaking, we can view research philosophies on a spectrum from positivism, which is sort of the hard scientific method, through to interpretivism, which is more focused on understanding and interpreting human behavior and appreciating the subjectiveness of, of all of that. And then somewhere in the middle sits pragmatism. And so, as I say, I'm not going to go into detail about that yet. That's not the point of this video, but these are the kinds of things that you would want to discuss within your research philosophy. And what's important here is that your research philosophy is not just some random choice. What it needs to align with is your research aims and your research questions. You need to make sure that your research philosophy suits the thing that you're trying to figure out your research aims. What's also really important is that you make it clear why you've chosen. So as I say, you want to make sure that there's a good fit between the philosophy and the research aims. And then even more importantly, you want to state it clearly, you want to justify in your writing, this is why I've chosen this philosophy. So as with all choices within the methodology chapter, and I'm going to sound like a stuck record on this matter, as with all choices, you want to discuss both the what and the why. From there, we go on to the research approach. So this is speaking about whether your study is going to adopt a qualitative approach, in other words, a words-based approach, a quantitative approach, so numbers, statistics-based approach, or a mixed methods approach. So this is, again, one of those choices that you'll need to be very explicit about. You'll need to state which approach you're taking and why you're taking that approach. Quite commonly, the qualitative approach aligns with an interpretivist philosophy, so you want to make sure that you've got some alignment there. Similarly, a quantitative approach tends to lie on the positivist side, and mixed methods can be used within a pragmatist type philosophy. So you want to make sure that when you get to the section research approach that you've got strong alignment with the previous choice, which was your research philosophy, and that it still makes sense given your research aims and your research questions. You want that a strong alignment throughout this chapter. Then we move on to the research strategy sometimes also called the research design. And this is the overall plan structure that you're going to use to uh, approach your study. And so this can be divided into qualitative, quantitative and uh, mixed methods type designs. On the qualitative side, the phenomenological design is a common approach. Grounded theory is another option. Ethnography is another option. Case studies, another option. On the quant side, descriptive, correlational, experimental. These are the sorts of designs that you'd be looking at. Again, I'm not going to go into detail about what these things are. We've got plenty of information on the Great Coach blog, and you can find all of that links in the description as usual. What's important again here is that there is alignment, that your research design, your research strategy is well aligned with what you've spoken about previously. So obviously, if you are taking a qualitative research approach, you don't want to start talking about a correlation or experimental research design because that would demonstrate that there's a misalignment and a misunderstanding. So you want strong alignment between each of the choices that you're making at each of these levels. From there, it would generally make sense to talk about your sampling strategy. So on the sampling side, you're wanting to talk about what type of uh, sampling strategy are you adopting? So is it a probability sampling strategy, such as simple random sampling, or are you taking a more sort of convenience-driven non-probability approach? And again, you want to be stating, yeah, not just what you're doing, but why you're doing it. When it comes to sampling, very often just the, the practical constraints are a big deciding factor in terms of what sampling strategy you take. In other words, it might be ideal for you to take a stratified random sampling approach, but you just don't have the ability to do that within your set of resources. So you might take more of a purposive approach or perhaps even a convenience approach. So what you want to be doing in this section is making clear that you understand what the strengths and weaknesses of your chosen approach are and why you've decided that that nevertheless is the best option. Remember, when it comes to research methodology, 
There's the best way to do things, ideal research methodology for any given set of research aims and, and research questions. And then there's the realistic research methodology. And when you're writing a dissertation or thesis, chances are you're going to have a lot of resource constraints. And so you need to be practical. Although you may want to go for a more sophisticated sampling strategy, you might need to ratchet that down and just live with what you can do and recognize that there are limitations to that. If all of this sampling lingo sounds a bit confusing to you and you're not too familiar with sampling, again, we've got plenty of information on the Grad Coach blog and we'll include a link to a great explainer video below. From there, we move on to the really practical level and hopefully you can see as we've been talking through this this template, as we've been talking through these choices, you can see they're going from the really high level strategic stuff through to more practical decisions. So now we're getting down to the data collection methods. In other words, how are you going to collect data? How are you going to get access and get into the battlefield and get the data that you need for your study. So yeah, it's usually things like interviews and focus groups and observations on the qualitative side and on the quantitative side, surveys are quite common, especially within the social sciences, or it might be measurements that you're taking or data that's produced by some sort of testing equipment, laboratory equipment, or you might be using existing data sets in terms of secondary data. So what you want to be describing here is Again, the what and the why. What will you do in terms of your data collection? How are you going to go about collecting that? Is that practical? Is that manageable? And why have you chosen that route? Again, this is a space where there might be some trade-offs. You might ideally want to be doing a massive survey, but in reality, your sample size is going to be a little bit restricted because you only have access to, let's say, 50 participants. What you want to make sure of in this space is check with your university what their minimum sample sizes are, uh, especially on the quant side. You want to make sure that whatever you're going to put down here, that is acceptable to your university. Then from there, we've spoken about data collection. And so naturally, the next logical thing to speak about is data analysis. How are you going to analyze the data that you found. And yeah, you really want to be as specific as possible, be as detailed as possible, make it clear how you approached this side of your research, because this is a space where students can often get a little bit murky, and then that impacts how their, their whole project turns out. So on the qualitative side, there's a few options, content analysis, thematic analysis are probably the two most common ones that we see at Grad Coach when we're helping students. And then on the quantitative side, it's almost unlimited. Typically, you'll start with some sort of descriptive statistics, you'll describe your sample, and then depending on your research aims and your research questions, you'll then go into the inferential statistics such as ANOVAs and correlations and regressions and so forth. Again, if that sounds a little bit confusing to you, we've got plenty of information on the blog, both for qualitative and quantitative methods. So be sure to check out that content. As always, links in the description. From there, we will usually wrap things up, but it's worth mentioning that another common thing that gets included within the methodology chapter is a discussion of the limitations. Now, what I've been speaking about here, you can see that I've kind of been weaving limitations into each of these points. So there's essentially two ways that you can go about this. Either you can, as you speak about each choice, you can speak about the limitations thereof, and that sometimes provides a very smooth flowing narrative. Or it might be the case that your university wants you to specifically to speak about it separately. And so then that would be something that would come at the end. So following data analysis methods, you'd speak about the limitations of that approach. So keep that in mind. That aside, we would usually then wrap up with a conclusion. And this is really just a quick wrap up. You don't want to be restating everything that you went through in the chapter. You want to just provide a high level summary, maybe a paragraph, two paragraphs maximum. And we've got a little example of what that might look like here. What's most important is that this is a summary. So don't introduce new information that you haven't already presented in the chapter. You want to just be concluding, wrapping up, summarizing, and that's all that's needed in this section.
All right, so let's take a look at the example research methodology chapter. Now, as I mentioned, this research methodology chapter is from a dissertation. Specifically, it's from a master's level dissertation, an MBA dissertation. And what the research was looking to achieve was to understand what factors influenced consumer trust within the context of a financial services provider, specifically a CFD trading brokerage. You don't need to understand what that is, but what's useful to understand is that this research the study was looking to understand what factors drove trust. So it's looking at trust as a dependent variable and the factors as the independent variables, the things that influence that dependent variable. So let's take a look at the actual chapter. So you can see that we kick off here with an introduction. It doesn't state that it's an introduction, but it's the first section of the chapter. So naturally it is. And this introduction just starts by clearly stating what this chapter will seek to do or rather how it's laid out. And what has been quite nicely used here is a visual. We always encourage students to use visuals where it makes sense to do so and especially where it helps the reader understand what's going on, get a quick view of the chapter or of the content that's being discussed. So this is just a quick overview of the chapter structure and that's a nice way of signposting things. Then it moves on to discuss the research aim and the research questions. So in this specific study, these were already discussed previously. And so it's not introducing new information, but what it's doing is reminding the reader that this is what we're aiming for. We're aiming to identify potential antecedents, drivers of organizational trust, and the research question is as follows. So this is just really useful to remind the reader. Naturally, a dissertation is a long document, and so you want these little, little pit stops to help them recap on what's important and to frame and contextualize each chapter. So then what goes on from here or how we proceed from here is that the conceptual framework is presented. And again, the conceptual framework in this scenario is just providing a good overview of what's been identified within the literature review. So it is highlighting what the independent variables are and what the dependent variable is. And also just reminding the reader of how that links to each of the hypotheses. So again, you don't need to know what all of these are, but what's a useful takeaway here is that, again, visuals are being used in this case, a conceptual framework, just summarize everything that's been learned so far in the preceding chapters. Then from there, it moves into the actual um, methodological design, the study design. And so, Here's where the magic really happens. So it kicks off by discussing the purpose of the research. And this is actually using a different framework from what we saw in the research proposal template. In the research proposal template, that framework was loosely speaking based on the research onion, whereas this is using Secker and Boogie's design framework, which was from the textbook prescribed for this specific course. So that's something worth noting is that if your university has provided you with a research skills textbook and they're providing a very specific framework there for structuring the methodology, then you might want to consider using that to structure your chapter. So the design kicks off by speaking about the purpose and it states that this is a combination of descriptive and correlational research and it can be understood as confirmatory in nature and therefore lends itself to a deductive fixed design approach. So that's a design decision that has been made and it is going to be deductive. Now, what's useful to note here is that the paragraph proceeds to say, notwithstanding an inductive approach may also be invaluable. So this is stating or acknowledging that there are alternative approaches and then justifying why this was chosen, why this deductive approach was chosen. You'll remember previously or earlier I said that it's not just about the what, it's about the why. You want to be setting what you're doing and why you chose to go that route and also acknowledging that the alternative ways to approach things and nevertheless you have chosen to go this route that really demonstrates your understanding of the research methodology at hand so yeah you can see that speaking about the pragmatist perspective so this section is touching on the research philosophy which we spoke about in the template and again stating not just which perspective was taken but why that was taken from there, it moves on to speak about the research approach. So this is qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. 
And this is actually using the provided textbook or the provided study guide material to make the argument here. So it's saying that Thurloway proposed that one's approach to research methods should be informed by multiple factors, including X, Y, Z. And then it goes on to provide a very clear argument as to, for each of those factors, why quantitative research made most sense in this uh, scenario. So again, strong justifications. The methodology chapter is all about justifying. And the reason that's so important in a dissertation is because it demonstrates to the marker that you know why you chose a certain approach, not just that you decided to go this route because you like quantitative or you like qualitative, but that it actually made sense within your specific context. From there, we then move on to a little section called general details. And this is really just a clumping section, a dumping ground for all the little bits and pieces that didn't quite fit elsewhere. And so you might want to make use of this in your methodology chapter. Sometimes it doesn't make sense for something like time horizon, which is such a, a basic concept. It doesn't make sense to give that its own section. So you might want to clump some things together. And as you can see here, yeah, we've spoken about three different things and again, just stating what the choice was and why that was the choice. Moving on to the research strategy. This is speaking about the survey based research strategy and again, stating why that was suitable. So given the studies need to systematically collect information from a large geographically dispersed sample. So one, a lot of people and two, they're all in different places a survey made sense. It would be very difficult to do that on an interview basis within the confines of a dissertation or thesis. So from there, we move on to sampling. And again, this is speaking about the what and the why. So we've got two dimensions to sampling. Yeah, one is the actual sampling method. So is it a simple random sampling? Is it purposive? Is it convenience? And two is the size of the sample. And so this paragraph or three or four is making a clear argument as to why the sample size was acceptable given the population. And that population was estimated based on a few assumptions and all of that's detailed here. And then stating what uh, actual sampling method was used. And in this case, we're clearly saying yeah, that while probability sampling would have provided more generalizable findings, in other words, while it would have been a superior options, time and cost restrictions led the author to adopt a non-probability approach. So getting practical, getting realistic within the context of a dissertation to say, hey, we recognize that this would have been superior, but realistically, this is what we can do. And we're going to acknowledge those limitations. So limitations are not something to avoid. What you want to be doing is making it very clear that you recognize the limitations and that you're going to account for them as far as possible. And that notwithstanding those limitations, the research will still be useful. From there, it moves on to a section called survey design. So in terms of the methodology template, we're now erring into the space of data collection. And what it's providing here is a very clear overview of how the survey was designed and how those choices were made. So stating the what, stating the why. This is going into quite a bit of detail about one, how the survey was laid out and two, how the measurement tools within the survey were decided upon and selected. So each measure, which relates to each of the hypotheses is stated here. Yeah, where did it come from? What is it measuring? How many items does it have? What is the Cronbach's alpha? So if you're not familiar with these terms, it's not too important at this stage, at least, but within statistical research, you want to make sure that your measures are really reliable and that they're measuring things on a consistent basis. And so this is covering all that ground. So stating what was done in terms of the survey and why it was suitable and also showing that, hey, this is actually a strong set of results. This is a reliable tool that we've got here. Then still within the data collection realm, there's a pilot study, and this is quite common with surveys, pilot study being a little test run of a smaller set of respondents. So in this case, 40 respondents were used. And this is describing exactly how that pilot study was undertaken and what happened as a result of that pilot study, so what adjustments were made. So that's really useful. Administration and data collection. We're now talking about how the survey was deployed and how data was collected and you can see this is providing very detailed step-by-step -step information. You want to have a lot of detail in your methodology chapter because it needs to be really clear to your marker 
how you went about this so that they can see that okay everything was done ethically and everything was above board but also it's important from a replication perspective or reproducibility perspective that other researchers can go and build on the study by following a similar approach so this is stating how everything was undertaken and in this case participation was incentivized by lucky draw prize and of course that is something that might draw some criticism where people might say well you know incentivization was that a good choice so again this is providing a critical discussion of why that choice was made and what the potential risks are in that from there we're talking about the data preparation and cleansing in other words this moves into the data analysis phase or just prior to the data analysis phase and again very very detailed high level of detail speaking about all the steps that were taken to ensure that the data is as clean as possible so this is demonstrating that you've taken a really really critical approach and then following that whole preparation and cleansing process the resultant sample that came from it so then we move into the actual data analysis and again just providing a lot of specificity being very very clear about what the steps were in terms of analysis, how the variables were approached, how reliability was tested, and normality assessments and assumptions were tested, and really just making, making it very clear that the data analysis followed a very systematic, rigorous approach. In this specific study, there was an issue with the data being non-normally distributed, in other words, not following a bell curve. And so that is a, a great example of the reality of research is that things don't always come out exactly according to plan. Though that's not a problem, that doesn't create a major stumbling block for the study. But what is done here is that we're saying, okay, we found this issue and this is how we accounted for it. We were planning to use a statistical test X, Y, and Z, but that was based on the assumption of normally distributed data. And in this case, it's not normally distributed. And so this is what we've done to compensate for that. So explanation of how there was a detour from the original plan, but how that's still manageable. Right from there, a visual is once again used summarizing all of these choices that were made. And this specific framework, as I mentioned, is from the textbook that was provided. That is something just to keep in mind that if your university is prescribing a specific framework for structuring and thinking about methodology, you might want to use that as a way to structure your chapter and also as a way to summarize things visually at the end of the chapter. From there, we move on to a dedicated section about limitations. Now, as I mentioned, when we we're talking through the template, you might talk through the limitations piece by piece, or you might have a dedicated section. In this specific example, there was some discussion of limitations piece by piece as we went through the discussion, but nevertheless, there is still a dedicated section. And so this is breaking it down from different perspectives, methodological perspective, sampling perspective, potential biases, and the potential role of moderating and mediating effects between the variables. So this is just a good overview, a good wrap up of the limitations and this clear recognition of the potential limitations not trying to hide anything, rather saying well, this is what we're aware of. And so when it comes to, down to interpreting these results from the data analysis, we're going to keep all of these factors in mind. Last but not least, it wraps up with a summary. And this summary is really just a one paragraph, really just summarizing the approach that was taken rather than all of the little details and trying to summarize each bit of information that was discussed in this section. What is useful to note here is that the summary transitions to the next section. So if we have a look at this, we can see uh, the research design was discussed and the chap chapter was concluded with a discussion of limitations. The next chapter will apply the chosen methodology to analyze the data and test the hypotheses. So it's just one little line that is linking this chapter to the next one. Here we spoke about what the methodology is and in the next chapter we're going to apply that methodology and we're actually going to analyze the data. So that wraps up this chapter and allows the reader to then move on to the next section with a clear picture of exactly how the research was approached from a methodological perspective. All right, so that wraps up this video. As I mentioned, if you're keen to learn more about research methodology, be sure to check out our online course, 
Research Methodology Bootcamp for a step-by-step -step guide to piecing your chapter together. As I mentioned, to say thanks for watching this video, especially for watching it all the way to the end, we do have a special discount offer for you and you can find the links to that in the description below. Alternatively, if you're looking for hands-on help with your research methodology or any other aspect of your dissertation or thesis, be sure to check out our private coaching service where we hold your hand step-by-step -step through the research journey. You can learn more about that and book a free consultation over at gradcoach.com. So until next time, good luck.